you very much for organizing this very interesting conference and for inviting me. I'm very sorry I couldn't come in person because of time constraints, both at the beginning and the end of the conference. And sorry for my voice. Unfortunately, I got a bit sick, but that's the benefit of giving an online talk that I can still try to give it. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I would have. I would like a lot to listen to all the other talks, but I'm looking forward to seeing then the recordings. Uh, it looks like a very, very interesting program. So uh, with this expert audience on the interface of quantum sensors and precision metrology and new physics, um, I think not a lot of um, motivation is needed in this context. But I wanted, as a particle physicist from my background, I wanted to uh, present. Um, as, as the out, in the outline of first chapter, a little motivation of the landscape of new physics with a focus on the uh, feebly interacting new physics before focusing on two applications of uh, atomic clocks, one in the sense of isotope shifts to look for light new bosons, and then uh, on a new proposal how to use um, optical photons to uh, search for high frequency gravitational waves. So um, as particle physicists, um, we are always busy thinking about the big, uh, solutions to the big and pressing and unresolved issues of the standard model. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the most pressing issues, like the baryon asymmetry of the universe um, that is observed and that cannot be explained to this amount in the standard model. Uh, the standard model doesn't contain a viable candidate for dark matter. Then we need a solution to the strong CP problem. We want to understand why the Higgs mass is as light as it is compared to the Planck scale. And then there are also other hierarchies of scales that better one would understand. Um, we need to understand how the electric phase transition took place and uh, we need ingredients to make it uh, strongly first order and we need more CP violation than the standard model provides. And uh, we want to explain neutrino masses among other things. So several frontiers are needed to investigate these many and also various uh, like, di from different perspectives these, uh, these questions and um, the first frontier is often the energy frontier but more frontiers are being explored in the in the sky like with cosmology and astroparticle physics with precision experiments and with uh, high intensity experiments and um, actually it's quite nice to see how many quantum sensors are now on the market how different they are and how they actually are not just um, interesting from their technology but how they also help already to address uh, the, the pressing questions um, that the standard model leaves open like uh, electric dipole moments are the uh, prime probe to test um, cp violation beyond the standard model in addition to what colliders test in a quite complementary way and um, Interferometers are also presented at this workshop a lot, um, and um, a lot of uh, cavity experiments help, and uh, uh, atomic clocks are on the market, and hopefully soon there will be a nuclear clock to really search for light new physics that could be dark matter or mediated to a dark sector. Um, and uh, with this uh, model of the relaxion, even these uh, methods can help to investigate the hierarchy problem. So these are quite interesting connections. Um, and a good starting point to look yeah, into these uh, different fields and always knowing that it's not just because one can do it, but also because they can, one can really investigate some of the pressing questions. Um, and um, yeah, which, which new physics can be addressed by which um, method often uh, depends also on the kind of new physics and the, the um, paradigms that we use to uh, extend the standard model. So there are different approaches, how to extend the standard model, how to build a model beyond the standard model. Um, the standard um, and the most traditional approach and also very successful approach is adding more symmetries um, because this had the, the advantage that some terms um, of different origin might cancel because of relations between couplings or masses. This, of course, is applied in supersymmetry or the case in supersymmetry. Um, sometimes uh, new partners predicted that one can look for um, and these are solutions to the um, hierarchy problem in terms of supersymmetry or neutral naturalness. But another approach is uh, to base the new physics on dynamics where we expect that a parameter that is the free parameter in the standard model could be explained as a vacuum expectation value of the dynamical field and um, this connects to the um, see a strong CP problem in terms of the axion and then extended the uh, to the relaxion um, where uh, the observed Higgs mass can be explained by the stopping point of the evolution of a new field uh, relaxion. 
And um, so in this case, um, it, uh, I mean, it doesn't need to be that the new physics is heavy at the TV scale, there could still be models at the TV scale, or maybe physics at the TV scale and at lower scales, but it also gives a clear guidance to look for light new physics. And then if we turn to the question of uh, dark matter beyond in models beyond the standard model, there's a plethora of ideas how to build dark matter candidates and which frameworks of adding um, heavier new particles or lighter ones uh, compared to the particles in the standard model. Um, and um, this is uh, reflected here in this um, overview of how heavy dark matter could be if it's primordial black holes. Um, or how light it can be, even wave-like um, in the regime of ultralight dark matter. And there are several talks at this conference um, addressing rather the light dark matter frontier. Um, if dark matter is dark, it means it doesn't couple to the standard model, but the possibility is to have a mediator that couples to the visible sector, so the standard model particles, and at the same time to uh, the hidden sector where the dark matter particles live and uh, the mediator can couple very feebly to the standard model. And um, this, um, in addition to the dark matter itself, also the mediator can be searched for and one can build quite um, broad categories of models and be relatively agnostic about the rest. Um, but typically feebly interacting particles are predicted that require searches in particular at the intensity and the precision frontiers. And the uh, typical candidates for such portals are if this new mediator is a vector boson, such as the dark photon, or is a scalar, uh, like a copy of the Higgs boson, but typically introduced as a singlet that can couple to the Higgs doublet field here, um, and also induce some mixing of the several scalars. There are also models with um, a fermion portal in terms of sterile neutrinos, and of course, famously, the axion as a pseudoscalar that comes with these different couplings to the photon and the gluon and, and fermions. So <clears throat> I will now look at um, how atomic clocks in particular um, isotope shifts help in the search for light new bosons. So um, when we imagine um, an atom and its energy levels, um, a transition will emit a photon of a certain wavelength. But what if we have a new particle, now let's call it phi as a scalar boson um, that interacts with the nucleus and with the electrons, this will shift the energy levels and therefore the frequency of the emitted photons. But the question is, um, yeah, can this change the rate of clocks? And is this change uh, measurable um, compared to the uncertainties? And one effect are variations of fundamental constants and that I won't speak about here, but I'm sure others uh, spoke already about this, so I will speak about it. Here I will focus on the case where exactly this new particle couples to electrons and neutrons. It can also couple to protons, but we will be insensitive for the method I will speak about to the coupling to protons. So here we look at a new physics that couples to electrons and neutrons with this coupling strength um, as a Yukawa coupling uh, that's why denoted by Ye and Yn and the mass of the particle plays a role in this exponential of the potential. And uh, how can we distinguish the new physics contribution from the backgrounds? Um, if there's experimental measurements of the frequencies are so precise, but if the theory and nuclear uncertainties are way larger. So here in a, a team of particle and atomic physicists, we proposed a method to look for um, such new bosons by adding more data in, in the situation that we are not able to predict the frequencies um, from scratch. And by adding more data means measuring at least two transitions and three isotope pairs very precisely. So we will compare the frequencies in different isotopes A and A prime. And uh, already known from the 60s is the description of a <clears throat> isotope shift. It's the same frequency i or the same transition i measured in isotopes a and a prime that can be um, split into the mass shift and the field shift that are each factorized at leading order into an electronic factor here in red and the nuclear factor. In this case, for the mass shift, it's the reduced mass. In terms of the field shift, it's the variance of the um, nuclear uh, charge radius. And 
this is the least known quantity, this uh, nuclear charge radius distribution. So the trick is to measure the same frequency, to measure two frequencies in the different isotope pairs and to replace the unknown by the second equation, by the second measured frequency, by the second transition. And then the prediction at leading order is that the um, frequency in transition two here, this M means it's normalized by the reduced mass, is a linear function plus some constant shift um, of the first transition. And already early data from 2015 showed linear king plots. They're called king plots because of the, the trick applied here to replace the least known quantity by additional data. And um, the early king plots and most king plots so far turn out to be linear. So as long as they are linear, one can say that the higher order terms that are neglected in this description are smaller than the experimental resolution. But one can also ask the question, what if there's a new physics contribution that will depend on the couplings of this new particle to electrons and neutrons? Um, in order to resolve this, one will have to check if three points, the three isotope pairs are on a straight line. So this simplifies a complicated pr um, problem into a simpler check out of data. But of course, we have to be aware of the interpretation and the limitations of such a method. Um, so the early data I showed you on the previous slide gave rise to the first bound here in black. So that's a bound on the a coupling of um, the new, new boson to electrons and neutrons as a function of the new boson mass, M phi here given in electron volts. And we see that um, it already gives a bound um, of a broad mass range. However, uh, competing bounds are stronger here. Uh, other probes also test the product of the coupling of a new particle to electrons and to neutrons. Um, and the um, most comparable competitor here is to get a, a bound on the coupling of a new boson to electrons from the G minus two of the electron and to get a bound on the neutron coupling from neutron scattering experiments where here we combine different neutron scattering experiments into an overall bound uh, of the whole mass range. Um, and um, a big improvement was possible due to the measurement in 2020 by the team in Aarhus of the calcium um, defined splitting in calcium, isot uh, calcium plus isotopes um, and uh, even in four isotope pairs. So therefore this we generalized the method and applied the new data and could improve the bound within a few years by a factor of 30, but it's still within this already excluded range. But um, looking at into the future of what could be achieved um, with realistic precision and in other elements shows that there's a possibility to probe a new parameter space um, with even more precise isotope shifts. Um, this is now presented in a quite generic model of just a new scalar mo modeled by a, a Yukawa potential, but one can reinterpret these bounds also in par concrete particle physics applications, for example, in a, for a vector boson, so a new Z boson, a Z prime of the um, B minus L, or in a dark photon or a chameleon effect. And if you work with few electron systems where there's um, where there are precise predictions from theory and precision data, then one can compare directly the experiment to the theory and set direct bounds on the couplings of a new particle to electrons, neutrons, and protons. So that was so far, that was the story of calcium. And here we can look at um, the king plot of ytterbium, where in 2020, um, the team by Blood and Vulicic at MIT measured a nonlinear uh, ytterbium king plot. And the, um, with a quite significant nonlinearity that has been uh, confirmed and even um, found to be even larger um, by more precise data that came later. And then the question is, of course, if one sees a nonlinearity in this king plot method, how can one interpret it? Could it be a higher order effect that has been neglected in the like very simple pretty, um, description, or could it be the case that there there are um, new physics that, that there are new bosons involved? And some journalists uh, were already asking this question, while. And from the physics side, we probably try to be um, cautious and say there. Um, so this method is kind of a exclusion method. It's not a discovery method of new physics. If you see a nonlinearity, you have to study uh, more carefully the predictions, and then it's less data driven because one needs more theory input or complementary experimental input about the nucleus. And ytterbium is a complicated system, and um, at the moment we have a 
um, broad collaboration going on to investigate more precisely measured euterbium isotope shifts measured by Tanya Nilstolper and her group uh, combined with um, isotope masses uh, from the MPI in, in Heidelberg plus theory interpretation. So we want to find out more carefully to which degree new physics or which degree most of all nuclear physics can account for the observed nonlinearity. Um, a, a good way to move forward in case one has more data is to, to generalize the king trick of replacing the least known quantities by additional data in case one cannot make a precise theory prediction. So instead of just replacing one nuclear parameter, namely the nuclear charge distribution, one can continue to replace other nuclear parameters like higher order terms of the field shift or of the mass shift um, by additional data. And this works if you have a matching number of uh, clock transitions, isotopes and higher order terms that you want to uh, um, eliminate. So um, this team developed a, a generalized king plot approach to um, show that one can even recover almost ideal sensitivity in case of a non-linearity if one adds more data. Um, so with a um, no, normal king plot without any assuming that no standard model non-linearity is present, one would expect under these uh, assumptions that were put in this uh, model um, an exclusion bound like this green line. And by injecting a standard model nonlinearity um, in this example, this would decrease the bounds to this level because the more nonlinearity one finds, the less strong um, bounds one can set. But by accounting for the nonlinearities in this generalized king plot, one uh, can go back to this black line and recover almost the ideal uh, sensitivity. Um, so one can see that this method remains um, valid and one can learn a lot. Um, by adding um, more theory input or by adding more um, experimental data. But what if this, uh, if you if you have the lucky situation to over constrain your system, not just to have the necessary amount of data to make this combination of the generalized king plot, because it boils down to inverting a matrix that has to be quadratic. What if you have the lucky situation to have more data than the minimum, bare minimum that you need? Then that's usually what you aim for. You want to over constrain your system. And for this, uh, we are now working um, uh, together with my PhD student Agnes Mariotti and my postdoc uh, Fiona Kirk and our collaborator PhD student Matteo Robiati from CERN uh, on a global fit to prepare the framework and apply to the first available data. But it was the idea that if you have any number of transitions of and isotope pairs um, to uh, make a combined analysis. And mostly also to think, if we think that there, if there should be new physics, it should affect different systems. Then the effect shouldn't only show up in one element, unless there are reasons why the nucleus is such that only in that one system one would expect to have sensitivity. But in general, it will be great to have uh, data from very uh, complementary systems and combine them into one global fit. Um, and this um, is our approach here to combine, to compare uh, generalized king plots, but also with a fit. And uh, one possibility is also to apply the no mass king plot, so to eliminate the mass uncertainties that we have on the isotope masses by um, by additional data. And here with the different dots, you can see how different your bound can be where, depending on which subset of data you choose. Um, and um, the goal is to feed in at the end uh, um, data from different elements um, and test the same hypothesis of if, if there is, if new physics is compatible with the overall data or to find inconsistencies that could point to uh, further, further studies of nuclei. Um, there was already a global study of low energy data uh, performed by this team last year where they investigated a new physics hypothesis against co-data. So ultimately it will be nice to combine also um, the spectroscopic measurements is including king plots uh, together with co-data. So we are now setting up a, a, a fit program that we call key fit for the king fit, uh, where we can, uh, where we have different um, parts of the program to feed in the data, to build optimizers and minimizers for this um, kind of relatively complex uh, fitting problem, even though there are only usually few data points, but they all come with the uncertainties. 
Um, and to find a minimum for this. So the goal will be to have a global framework. So if any of you in the future will measure additional kink plots, we can then use your data and feed it into this system to find out if we get a, a consistent overall bound. Um, so the, it's a very dynamical field and more systems are being uh, proposed, but also already explored to uh, exploit um, the very precise um, spectroscopy. In this case, of um, highly charged ions, in this case, highly charged calcium, hydrogen PTB, with a precision of one hertz. So this is an um, ongoing project um, in a team based there mostly at PTB in, and uh, in Braunschweig and in Hannover, together in collaboration with uh, uh, Heidelberg and um, also Australia. So um, we are um, ex extracting a new bound, comparing isotope shifts in singly charged calcium versus calcium 14 plus. And this is already a uh, gives a, this uh, king plot of preliminary data is coming out linear. So um, this uh, gives rise to a stronger bound than the previous bound. So this is still preliminary. Um, and this becomes strong because it's combined with other strong data that exists already with a transition in singly charged calcium. But still, even though it has improved the previous bound, it's still weaker than this competing G minus two of the electron times neutron scattering. Um, but with a projection, if it's possible to measure um, at one point, at point 0.1 hertz uncertainty, and if the king plot will turn out linear, we expect to cover new, new territory of this dark matter landscape. And here we also see the role of the um, uncertainty, not only of, on um, the frequency measurements, but also on the mass measurements. So this the difference between the orange and the dashed orange line comes from taking the um, isotope mass uncertainties into account. It's the full bound, the weaker bound, or showing what happens if one can um, replace the uncertainties. Okay, so now in my last um, eight minutes, I want to come to the complementary topic of uh, test uh, searching for high frequency gravitational waves um, with optical photons. So this is uh, um, a project I did uh, together with uh, colleagues at CERN, Valerie Dunke, Joachim Korb, and Thorsten Bringmann, who was visiting CERN and is otherwise uh, based in Oslo. And this, I worked on this while I was also still at CERN. Um, so the uh, motivation is that uh, gravitational sources can cr create signals at very different frequencies and uh, depending on the and on the frequency one needs different um, techniques to search for and also detect and measure precisely that gravitational waves um, but there's no reason to stop at uh, the frequencies shown here um, there are attempts to push further uh, the frequency range and see what signals uh, could be hiding at higher frequencies. So here we are already looking up to 10 to the 6 hertz. And um, atom interferometers are also very powerful to look um, at relatively high frequencies uh, with very strong um, capabilities expected for future experiments. And uh, there are also talks about this at this, this conference. But here we want to see what happens if we want to push this frequency range even further and look into areas um, with potential uh, sources. But uh, here we focus on the methods, so try to be agnostic about the sources. But what what could we uh, what could help to detect gravitational waves if there are any at, at even higher frequencies? There are already proposals on the market to use interferometers and levitated sensors and radio cavities. So what we look at here from the basics is uh, to consider um, the frequency of a photon um, in a gravitational field. <clears throat> so we want to compare this, the frequency of a photon measured by the sender or the source S and the detector D. So we now assume that the, the photon um, with an initial momentum um, propagates in one direction. And uh, we have a gravitational wave. Even if we consider high frequency gravitational waves, the frequencies will be still much lower than the, uh, the photons. So we consider the perturbation of the metric to the first order in the gravitational wave string. And um, 
arrive at a um, equation to describe the relative difference between the um, photon frequency at the detector and the source in terms of these um, um, and tensor elements of the gravitational wave with effects um, at the, at the um, detector and the sensor and along the photon trajectory in the first line. So this is relative, this expression is relatively hard to expect in experiments. So we consider two cases, a rigid setup or a freely fo a freely falling detector that I focus on here now. And uh, it's most convenient to work in the um, a transverse traceless gauge where some elements of this tensor become zero and uh, where the observer remains at rest. So we um, calculated in this more convenient framework, again, the frequency shift by the gravitational wave and um, want to see how one can detect this. The problem and the challenge is uh, to um, measure tiny sidebands. And here I really want to thank uh, Jun Ye, uh, whose talk I unfortunately I missed yesterday, but who uh, helped us in a discussion to realize this, um, that the challenge will be to detect the sidebands um, that will be shifted from the carrier frequency by the gravitational wave frequency omega g. So that's the gravitational wave frequency. So it's, it means it's good for high frequency gravitational waves because the shift is relatively large, but still small compared to the overall frequency. And the problem is how small um, the sidebands are if they are suppressed by the um, amplitude squared, the gravitational wave strain squared. Um, and uh, one has to make sure to measure some signal above the tails of the carrier line. So how can one make the sidebands detectable? And uh, we, all, we uh, consider different um, setups, um, fiber break gratings, optical rectifiers, or also cavities. And here I want to thank uh, Clemens Hammerer as one of the organizers with whom we discussed also this. And I hope in the future, maybe also with people in the audience, we can uh, start new projects to explore more concretely what um, how it can be realized. So here I can show you what we propose. So um, how can optical clocks help? That's the big question if you have so good precision available. But uh, if we consider the photon signal propagating without a gravitational wave signal, that's shown here in orange and dashed. And we have the, like this, uh, these are some um, her settings for this uh, for this figure chosen to visualize the effect, but not uh, taking as realistic. If um, there's a presence of the gravitational wave, the photon signal modulates a bit. We see here in purple, but it averages out during the whole period of the gravitational wave. So if we um, look um, at the, at the um, spectrum, we only find the sideband, but no shift of the net frequency. However, if we um, apply an optical rectifier that cuts out the photon propagation during half of the gravitational wave period, so here during the gravitational wave period, it would shift its frequency continuously, not just in two colors as painted here, um, then we would the shift would not average out, but would add up, and uh, there's the hope to measure some slight shift. Um, so here's one uh, example shown for a small um, va small value of the product of the gravitational wave frequency um, and the length of the setup. Um, and uh, here the, the um, propagation during half the period is not averaged out. We see that in orange where there's no gravitational wave present, we, we see a shift that's just an effect of the shutter. What we want to what we want to compare is this shift of the uh, larger um, purple and orange lines. And the hope is to uh, detect something, some signal with such a method. So we had to um, stretch a little bit the uh, settings to make um, and put um, some assumptions uh, to make our bounds, our expected bounds, comparable to other proposals or existing bounds. Um, and um, that the signal duration is very important and also some assumptions about uh, the noise and the transmission of um, of the setup. So here we we show you always three different um, scenarios, uh, optimistic and uh, mid medium and pessimistic scenario of how precise such methods could be. And we see that the sideband method would be quite 
um, challenging, but the atomic clock method we hope is worth further exploring. Um, and this brings me just in time to my conclusion that I would say uh, the atomic sensors are very powerful for, from the particle physics perspective also, because they can help to test well motivated uh, new physics scenarios with light feebly interacting new particles. Um, the atomic clocks are really prime cases to exploit uh, precision and new systems are being developed and already um, applied. Um, I focused here on isotope shifts where the unprecedented precision, but also the growing list of available elements um, make more precise bounds possible and also call for a combination to make a, a, yeah, a test of the hypothesis of new physics. And uh, with a high frequency gravitation pro wave detection proposal, we found out it's uh, challenging to, to propose a good method. We all wrote a whole appendix about ideas we had that we found out didn't work. Uh, but we hope that uh, some of these can be further pursued and hopefully put into practice. So yeah, I did a lot is going on this, in this field and uh, it's as from a particle physics perspective, it's always nice to see the speed of developments of new measurements coming out compared to the time scale of colliders. Um, I also wanted to advertise that at CERN, there's now also a quantum technology initiative that I was involved in while I was still there and um, still um, uh, involved in organizing uh, a workshop for next uh, winter uh, focusing on quantum sensing for new physics. So um, it, the announcement is not yet out, but hopefully uh, several of this community will be interested. Thank you very much for giving me the possibility to give an online talk, for listening to my uh, voice, and I hope you have some questions. Thank you so much. <clears throat> questions? Perhaps you also say who you are, because it's sometimes hard. Oh, okay, I'm Murray Barrett from Singapore. Um, for the king plot thing, when you're looking at the different isotopes, um, is these isotopes explicitly uh, nuclear spin zero, or does there, how do you deal with the hyperfine structure? Yeah, very good question. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention it. Yes, we we uh, we reduce this complicated question to choosing just even isotopes. Of course, this limits the number of available isotopes uh, quite a lot, but it simplifies life so much. So if, yeah, if there were more precise calculations, one could maybe take also nuclear spin into account. That would broadly open the possibilities, the number of isotopes. And, um, but uh, it's too, at the moment too complicated. So here we are often happy if we have five isotopes, so four independent isotope pairs, um, and in some elements there are not even this many. Hi, uh, I have another question. This is uh, Igor Pikowski from uh, Stockholm at Stevens. Um, I have a question about uh, the gravitational wave detection you mentioned, um, yes. and so your signature are these sidebands, and what you showed is that they're suppressed by uh, the amplitude squared of the gravitational wave. Um, so in your method, what is your estimate, what type of amplitudes you would be able to resolve or, or what's the limit there? Yeah, so this one can see at this overview plot, um, that's the amplitude, uh, gravitational wave amplitude H. And these, this is um, the range of what is tested also in gray by other people's proposals or already existing um, bounds. Um, the question is, can this test any... Um, relevant signals, and the signals would come a few orders of magnitude below. Um, so this is, would still be a challenge, but we think it's still worth testing the technology and maybe there will be more advancements to also test the signals or maybe some, uh, some new models will predict signals in this range. Yeah, so the sideband method is shown here in orange. So it's, it, 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 even if it covers a quite broad range of frequencies, um, it, during uh, in most of the frequency range, it's not competitive with other um, other bounds. Thank you. I, I have a follow up question. What would be the sources in this range in the gigahertz? Yeah, that's um, that's indeed a good question. So there could be. Um, I think I have a backup slide. This oh, too many backup slides. So there, um, it's so 
They are on at be above 10 kilohertz. There are no known astrophysical sources that create signals large enough to detect them. And potential sources could involve a first order phase transition, could involve the mergers of primordial black holes, and also a very interesting case that was described here in such a paper in last year, the, of a phase transition in neutron star mergers um, con connected to the QCD phase transition. Um, so that could um, predict megahertz gravitational waves. But here now we were rather focusing our proposal on the direction of gigahertz um, gravitational waves. Yeah, but there could be sources, but they are not the, uh, the most... Um, most studied ones, and also it's difficult to get signals that are really large. Thank but you. yeah, so like it could be that uh, there are sources that we don't know of yet. So still, it's worth preparing the technology already, and and seeing as uh, agnostically if one can find something. But of course, it's uh, the goal is to find something. So yeah, it's it's good to know if there's something to be expected. Uh, Christian Sanner from Colorado State. I had another question regarding that um, gravitational wave detection in that schematic that you were drawing, like with the chopper or also the side bends. It looked a little bit as if you had to decide before doing the actual experiment about, you know, your chopping frequencies and, of course, the, the phase. Yeah. Um, but I assume that's the actual experiment would be such that you first acquire data and then you an analyze it with mm -hmm. all kinds of virtual chopping frequencies and 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 phase settings and so on. Um, yeah. So of course, one question is, what is actually the frequency that you want to measure, and if you know it, um, that would help. If you don't know the frequency that you look for, if there's no sharp prediction, and if there's a signal that scans frequencies then it could hit the moment, uh, it could hit for a moment the frequency that you're most sensitive to. Um, yes, but then cutting off um, the carrier line, um, that's the question of like how, how well can one do it? Um, and there one doesn't need to know exactly the gravitational wave if you can just cut um, cut the carrier line as well as uh, like if you do it as well as you can. Yeah, I see. I, I guess my my question was like, there's no need to to decide this before doing the actual experiment, right? You can probably acquire a full data set and then analyze it with all kinds of. Uh, yes, you could do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I have a question on your uh, now global fit yes. idea. So which data are you actually feeding there? Are you also feeding all existing theory data or are you just feeding like for various nuclear parameters? There is a large variety of data. Uh, for example, there is data for QEDs, there is data for the, uh, all those field shifts, the derivatives of the field shifts, or are you only feeding the experimental data? and just trying to so, combine all the global data. So for this, the data here in this uh, overview should be the experimental data. <coughs> right. And um, you will need the uh, to get bounds at the end, the um, theory predictions for the new physics coefficients that I didn't discuss here in this talk, um, to interpret it in terms of a coupling. You need to know yeah, the new physics coefficients. And then um, but which other parameters do you mean the um, like alpha electromagnetic so you don't need necessarily for the king plots, but in, at the end it would be nice to have a overall bound combining with all low energy precision data. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming to an online talk and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and I will try to zoom in or to watch the videos after watch the recordings and yeah and it thanks a lot nice. thanks also for the questions and it would be very nice to actually have the plotting software somewhere online so people have new experiments can just edit 
like uh, yeah we are still working on it so but okay. yeah hopefully and it's hopefully soon the first version will become available and then it will be fun yeah to combine whatever comes whatever new data comes on the market thank you thanks <laughs>